And hello, welcome to Now You See TV. I'm your host, Jake Grant, and we're joined once again by J.P. McMahon. Um, he's going to be taking us through the Book of Romans. Uh, he's done uh, three parts already. This is part four, and he's going to be doing Romans chapter seven. Um, but before we get into the show, I wanted to show off something really cool to you guys. Uh, John and I just got in our new order of Behold Nail, Behold Hand uh, hoodies, um, and you can check those out on the the nowuctv.org website. If you scroll down to the bottom, um, there's the little uh, like T-shirt uh, button, and you can see them um, if anybody wanted to get some. But yeah, these are super cool. Um, uh, it's got the Paleo Hebrew and uh, the Yod Hey Vav Hey. It's pretty awesome. Anyways, guys, um, uh, I know the show usually starts a little bit earlier. Um, uh, you usually start around like 12 o'clock Central, I think. Um, but, uh, unfortunately, um, John, uh, was busy and I was, uh, helping, uh, do some tree yard work. So, um, that's why the, there was a delay with, uh, the regular scheduled, um, commentary. Um, but, uh, without further ado, finally we're here, uh, and we're going to go ahead and get started with JP. So, Hey JP, how you doing? Yeah. Awesome, man. Looking awesome. forward to it. Yeah. Well, yeah, go ahead and, and take us into it. Okay, right, so this is part four, and we'll get right into Romans 7, because this is, I don't know, this is one of the most pivotal chapters of all of Scripture. Paul reveals some really, really awesome things in this. So he starts off, verse 1, he says, Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the Torah, that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over a man, as long as he liveth okay so paul immediately starts this chapter and he's speaking to people who already know the torah because he's going to delve deep into some of the mysteries that were in the tanakh that were only revealed through yeshua verse 2 says for the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth but if the husband be dead she is loosed from the law of her husband so how is this relevant to us and how would those who know the torah and the tanakh how would this make sense to them okay so we need to understand some information 1 kings 11 verse 31 we see one of the beginnings of this uh, story unfolding in the tanakh and this is when uh, solomon He's gone astray from the Lord, and um, Ahia, the prophet, says to Jeroboam, he says, Jeroboam is Solomon's son, and says, Take thee ten pieces, for thus saith Yehovah, the God of, of Israel, Behold, I will rend the kingdom out of the hand of Solomon, and I will give ten tribes to thee. Okay, so it's Rehoboam, sorry, Solomon's son, uh, who is supposed to take control of the entire kingdom of Israel, all 12 tribes. Achia says to Jeroboam, he says, look, Yehovah is going to take the kingdom out of the hand of Solomon and give 10 tribes to you. He gives the reason, he says, because that they have forsaken me and have worshipped Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Zidonians, Chumash, the god of the Moabites, and Milcom, god of the children of Ammon, and have not walked in my ways to do that which is right in my eyes, and keep my statutes and my judgments, as, David, as did David, his father. So this is Solomon going astray. The punishment is that the kingdom would not be passed on to his son Rehoboam. Only the house of Judah would have been uh, passed on. The house of Judah was made up of Judah, and Benjamin, two tribes, Judah and Benjamin, and Benjamin kind of became amalgamated into Judah. So we've got the uh, the layout of the tribes, uh, how the land was apportioned to them, and there was a split in the kingdom. We see this split actually before Solomon in the time of David, but David united all of the 12 tribes, and it was in the hand of Solomon as a united kingdom. So there was a split, if you can see the red line on the map. South of the red line was Benjamin and Judah. As I say, Benjamin 
became amalgamated into Judah, and the southern kingdom was called the House of Judah. Northern uh, ten tribes, they were called the House of Israel, and we see this throughout the scriptures then, just as an example, and we see this all over the scriptures, but we see in 1 Kings 22, 39, it talks about the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Israel, and in verse 45, it talks about the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Judah. So this was a divided kingdom with two different kings that were sat on the thrones. 1 Kings 17, 13 to 18 says, Yet Yehovah testified against Israel and against Judah by all the prophets. Okay, so he sends his prophets to warn Israel and warn Judah as they've gone astray, as they've gone after other gods. And Israel was worse than Judah. Israel had no good kings. Judah had a few good kings. Okay, so Yehovah testified against Israel and against Judah by all the prophets and by all the seers, saying, Turn ye from your evil ways and keep my commandments and my statutes according to all the law which I commanded your fathers and which I sent to you by my servants, the prophets. Because all of the Tanakh, we've got the Torah being given, and then we've got Israel and Judah going astray from these commandments, falling into sin. And Yehovah sent his prophets uh, to these people to warn them so the idea again that the the law has been done away with is nonsense we see in the uh, the parable of the evil tenants that we see uh, servants are sent to tell the tenants and they kill all of the servants or beat all of the servants then they see the sun coming does the sun have a different message he's got the same message so the servants in the example are the prophets the sun, in the example, the air, is, of course, Yeshua. So Yeshua doesn't come with a different message to the prophet. Yeshua's message was repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Okay, we've just lost the definition of what sin is. So we think Paul is talking about the law having been done away with, not even realizing that that would be impossible for him to be saying that. So we don't come at Paul's writings trying to understand what he actually means, knowing 100% that he's not talking about the law being done away with. We come at it from um, a mindset of people who think, well, maybe the law has been done away with. That is certainly possible. That's what the church teaches. So verse 14 says, Notwithstanding, they would not hear, but hardened their necks like to the neck of their fathers that did not believe in Yehovah their God. This is something that we'll see throughout the New Testament, actually, that disbelief or unbelief is equated with disobedience. It says, and they rejected his statutes and his covenant, the covenant that he made with their fathers and his testimonies, which he testified against them. And they followed vanity and became vain and went after the heathen that were round about them concerning whom Yehovah had charged them that they should not do like them. And they left all the commandments of Yehovah their God and made them molten images, even two calves, and made a grove, and worshipped all the host of heaven, and served Baal, just like Christian uh, Christianity today, just like the Christians today. They've left large parts of the Torah, at the very least, or the hyper grace movement has left all of the commandments, and they've gone after uh, worshiping Him through Christmas and Easter. So they've worshipped after Him. Um, using pagan uh, pagan worship rituals. Verse 17 says, And they caused their sons and their daughters to pass through the fire and use divination and enchantments and sold themselves to do evil in the sight of Yehovah to provoke him to anger. Important point here. Yehovah uh, defines doing good in his eyes as following his law. He defines doing evil in his eyes as going against the commandments. So again, this makes it impossible that the law has been done away with because that would be us saying, oh no, now Yehovah wants us to do evil in his eyes. And in fact, he sent his son to die in order to enable us to. Verse 18 says, therefore, Yehovah was very angry with Israel and removed them out of his sight. There was none left but the tribe of Judah only. Remember, uh, Judah and Benjamin had become one. They were called the house of Judah. So this tells us that Yehovah was very angry with 
the house of Israel, and he removed them out of his sight in a manner that we'll see in a second. The only people who were left in the land were the tribe of Judah. 2 Kings 18, 1 to 7 says, And it came to pass in the third year of Hoshea, son of Elah, king of Israel, that Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. Twenty and five years old was he when he began to reign, and he reigned twenty and nine years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Abi, the daughter of Zechariah, and he did that which was right in the sight of Yahuwah, according to all that David, his father, did. Okay, so we've got the king of Israel ruling, and at the same time, Hezekiah begins to reign. But Hezekiah isn't like the king of Israel. He does what is right in the sight of Yehovah. He follows all of his commandments. He removed the high places and break the images and cut down the groves and break in pieces the brazen serpent that Moses had made. For unto those days the children of Israel did burn incense to it and called it Nahushtan. He trusted in Yehovah, God of Israel, so that after him was none like him among all the kings of Judah, nor any that were before him. So this guy is the best one, okay? He follows after all of the commandments. We see sometimes uh, the kings of Judah will be very good, but they won't get rid of the high places. It says, for he clave to Yehovah and departed not from following him, but kept his commandments, which Yehovah commanded Moshe. Notice how keeping the law is spoken of all the way through the Tanakh. It's doing right it's cleaving to Yehovah to keep the commandments which he commanded Moshe. And the Lord was with him and he prospered with this. However, he went forth and he rebelled against the king of Assyria and served him not. So the, uh, the house of Israel, they were taken into captivity by this guy, by the king of Assyria. They were taken away out of the land. But this guy, Hezekiah, he did what was right in the sight of Yehovah. And he rebelled against the king of Assyria, and Yehovah was with him. So Judah did not go with Israel. Remember, Israel were worse than Judah. 2 Kings 25, 1 to 7 says, And it came to pass in the ninth year of his reign, in the tenth month, in the tenth day of the month, that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came. He and all his host against Jerusalem pitched against it, and they built four, forts around, uh, against it round about, sorry. And the city was besieged unto the 11th year of King Zedekiah. Okay, so we've had Hezekiah, he was good. So then being taken out of the land was, um, was put off a little time. Okay, uh, the house of Israel went into captivity in 722 BC. The house of Judah, which we're going to see here, went into captivity in 586 BC. And on the ninth day of the fourth month, the famine prevailed in the city and there was no bread for the people of the land and the city was broken up. Okay, this is Jerusalem, different king. This isn't the king of Assyria. This is the king of Babylon this time. So the house of Israel were taken into captivity in Assyria. Judah, as we'll see, are taken to Babylon. And all the men of war fled by night by the way of the gate between two walls, which is by the king's garden. Now the Chaldeans were... Uh, against the city round about and the king went the way toward the plain and the army of the Chaldees pursued after the king and overtook him in the plains of Jericho and all his army was scattered from him okay so the king uh, ruling in Jerusalem Zedekiah he he was pursued and they overtook him all his army was scattered away from him they took the king and brought him up to the king of Babylon to Rivla and they gave judgment upon him and they slew the sons of Zedekiah before his eyes and put out the eyes of Zedekiah, bound him with fetters of brass and carried him to Babylon. Verse 9 says, and he burnt the house of the Lord. Okay, this is uh, Nebuchadnezzar and the king's house and all the houses of Jerusalem and every man's house and every great man's house he burnt with fire. Verse 21 says, and the king of Babylon smote them and slew them at Rivlai in the land of Hamath. So Judah was carried away out of their land. So we've had the house of Israel. They were led out of their land. They were actually led out with fish hooks in their mouths. Okay, very embarrassing, very painful way for them to be led out. It's actually 
uh, quite remarkable that Yeshua, when he was traveling through Galilee, he calls people, uh, he called his disciples, and he said to them that they would be fishers of men. And that will you'll see why that is relevant in a little bit. So here we've got a map that shows uh, the red arrows show where the Assyrians took the house of Israel into captivity. Green arrows show uh, where the house of Judah were taken. They were taken into Babylon. And that was the time that we hear about uh, in the book of Daniel, um, right up until uh, the return of Judah. Now, the house of Israel, they've never returned to the land. The house of Judah did return to the land. Okay, after 70 years, their captivity uh, was over and they returned to the land. And that's actually why we associate the land today with the Jews. The name Jew comes from Judah. We don't associate it with the house of Israel. We think that the Jews live in Israel. Jeremiah 3 verse 8 says, And I saw when for all the causes whereby backsliding Israel, that's the house of Israel, committed adultery, I had put her away. Okay, and given her a bill of divorce, this is going to become very relevant to what Paul is talking about. If you remember, uh, it says that a woman is bound by the law to her husband as long as he is alive. I've given her a bill of divorce, yet her treacherous sister Judah feared not. So the house of Israel, they were actually given a bill of divorce by Yehovah. They were divorced from him. They were out of covenant at this point. Judah was not. We have no record of Judah being given a bill of divorce. In John 7, 35, we see that it actually speaks of this. Okay, this brought into uh, the New Testament times. It says, then said the Jews among themselves at this point, Judah are the only people who are in the land. So it's speaking of the Jews. Then said the Jews among themselves, whither will he go that we shall not find him? Will he go to the dispersed among the Gentiles? They knew of this dispersion of the house of Israel. In Isaiah 49, verse 6, this is a prophecy of Yeshua, and it speaks of him restoring the house of Israel. It says, and he said, it is a light thing that thou shouldest be my servant to raise up the tribes of Yaakov, of Jacob, and to restore the preserved of Israel. And uh, I will also give thee for a light to the Gentiles that thou mayest be my salvation unto the end of the earth. So Yehovah's people were scattered amongst the Gentiles. This was known about, and there were prophecies about the restoration. In Matthew 15, 24, Yeshua says himself, but he answered, Yeshua answered and said, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He knew what his mission was. Okay, we've got the prophecy right there that this would be what Mashiach would do. In Matthew 10, 5 to 6, it says, These twelve Yeshua sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles and into any city of the Samaritans. Enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. I think when people read over this, they think, Oh, the house of Israel. That's Israel. That's the twelve tribes. Go to the lost sheep of Israel. It's not true. Again, they were in Judea, and he sends them to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So Judah are in the land at this point, and he's sending them to the lost sheep of the northern tribe who have been scattered amongst the Gentiles. Luke 2.25, it says, And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem, Jerusalem, whose name was Simeon. And the same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel again he was waiting for this a lot of people in fact were waiting uh, for the reunification they were waiting for the messiah for the reunification of Israel because they they knew that it was him that would bring all of the tribes together because of some prophecies that we'll see now Deuteronomy 24 1 to 4 tells us something okay this is in Yah's law Yah of course follows his own law because it's his nature to do so it's described as his ways what is right in his eyes and of course he is the source of all good so he will follow his own law verse one says when a man hath taken a wife so Yehovah had married israel 
he'd married all 12 tribes of Israel and he'd married the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom okay but he speaks of them separately after there was the split in the kingdom which he brought about himself he speaks of them separately so when a man hath taken a wife and married her it shall come to pass that she has found no favor in his eyes just as Israel didn't just as he said that he's given them a bill of divorcement it says because he hath found some uncleanness in her okay the the house of Israel committed adultery against Yah then let him write her a bill of divorcement as we saw in Jeremiah 3 verse 8 okay it says and give it into uh, give it in her hand and send her out of his house so this is exactly what Yah did with the house of Israel he gave them a bill of divorcement and he sent them forth among the Gentiles and it says and when she is departed out of his house she may go and be another man's wife and if the latter husband hate her and write a bill of divorcement and giveth it in her hand and sendeth her out of his house or if the latter husband die which took her to be his wife her former husband Yahuwah which sent her away may not take her again to be his wife after that she is defiled so this is a real problem for the house of Israel they've been given a bill of divorcement however we'll see in the Tanakh there were many many prophecies that they would be taken back into covenant how would Yehovah do, do this this was a question that puzzled the sages of the time the people who studied the scriptures they did not know how Deuteronomy 24 could be true how it could be true that the house of Israel had been divorced and yet it was also true through some prophecies that we'll see that they would be brought back how is that possible Yehovah cannot break his own law in Ezekiel 16 verse 8 it says now when I passed by thee and looked upon thee behold thy time was the time of love and I spread my skirt over thee and covered thy nakedness yea I swear unto thee and entered into covenant with thee saith um, Adonai Yehovah and thou becamest mine okay so talking about at Sinai okay he took them as his bride Ezekiel 16 30 to 32 though shows where they ended up verse 30 says how weak is thine heart saith Yehovah Adnai Yehovah seeing thou doest all these things the work of an imperious uh, whorish woman in that thou buildest thine eminent place in the head of every way and makest thine high place in every street and hast not been as a harlot in that thou scornest higher so he's saying of Israel look you're not even like a harlot who's taken money verse 32 says but as a wife that committeth adultery which taketh strangers instead of a husband okay so this is why they were divorced because they had committed adultery against him again Jeremiah 3 8 it says very plainly here that Israel was given a bill of divorce and that is separate to her treacherous sister Judah Deuteronomy 28 62 to 65 gives us some information so that we can understand what was happening there did Yehovah just spring this on them did he say right that's it you're divorced or did he give them warning well, we see in the curses for disobedience which are listed in Deuteronomy 28 in verse 62 it says and ye shall be left few in number whereas ye were as the stars of heaven for multitude because thou wouldest not obey the voice of Yehovah thy Elohim thy God and it shall come to pass that as Yehovah rejoiced over you to do you good and to multiply you so Yehovah will rejoice over you to destroy you and to bring you to naught and ye shall be plucked from off the land whither thou goest to possess it and Yehovah shall scatter thee among the people all people from the one end of the earth even unto the other and there thou shalt serve other gods which neither thou nor thy fathers have known even wood and stone and among these nations shalt thou find no ease okay so he tells them this is what's going to happen this is kind of at the pinnacle of the curses when all of the other curses had come upon them which they had on the house of Israel by this point then he says I'm gonna just scatter you I'm gonna take you off the land and I'm gonna scatter you amongst all of the people of the earth 
Deuteronomy 29 says, And that men shall say, because they have forsaken the covenant of Yehovah, God of their fathers, which he had made with them when he brought them forth out of the land of Egypt. For they went and served other gods and worshipped them, gods whom they knew not and whom he had not given unto them. And the anger of Yehovah was kindled against this land to bring upon it all the curses that are written in this book. And Yehovah rooted them out of the land in anger and in wrath and in great indignation and cast them into another land as it is this day. Okay, so all the way back in Deuteronomy 29, before they'd even entered into the land of Egypt, he told them this was going to happen as a consequence of their disobedience. But Deuteronomy 30 bears great news. Great news for us. It says, and it shall come to pass when all these things that are come upon thee, the blessing and the curse which I have set before thee, and thou shalt call them to mind among all the nations with the Yehovah thy God hath driven thee. Okay, so when you're in all of these nations, okay, you're going to call all of these things to mind and shall return unto Yehovah thy God and shall obey his voice according to all that I command thee this day. This is why there are people all over the earth who are coming to a knowledge of Torah. It's prophesied to happen. We are seeing prophecy fulfilled in our day and we who are turning back to Torah are part of this prophecy. Thou and thy children with all thine heart and with all thy soul, that then Yehovah thy God will turn thy captivity and have compassion upon thee and will return and gather thee from all the nations where the Yehovah thy God hath scattered thee. And if any of thine be driven out to the outermost parts of heaven, from thence will Yehovah thy God gather thee, and from thence will he fetch thee. And we see that this is fulfilled. We see in uh, Matthew 24, verse 31, it says that he will send his angels out to the furthest parts of heaven and gather all of his people together. So what's being spoken of here is when people turn back to following Torah, and let's not forget we are part of the house of Israel because we are grafted in to the house of Israel, okay? When we turn, when we realize what our forefathers have done and we turn and repent and we obey his voice according to everything that was commanded to Moshe back um, when Deuteronomy 30 is talking about, okay, when the law was repeated to them, when that happens, it says, Yehovah thy God will turn thy captivity and have compassion upon thee and will return and gather thee from all the nations. Okay, this is the return of Yeshua when the angels are sent out and we are all gathered together. Not only that, though, he says that he will take us back to the land. It says, and Yehovah thy God will bring thee into the land which thy fathers possessed and thou shalt possess it and he will do thee good and multiply thee above thy fathers. And Yehovah thy God will circumcise thine heart and the heart of thy seed to love Yehovah thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul that thou mayest live. And this is his exact plan. This is how he circumcised our hearts. He scattered his people all throughout the world to be in despair amongst the nations. Okay, just like Lot, whose uh, righteous soul was vexed as he lived amongst the heathen through that he causes us to turn back to him to follow all of his commandments and in that he achieves this which he says he circumcises our heart deuteronomy 24 again okay just to remind us of the problem that we've got here when a man's taken a wife and married her okay he's sent out of the house he's given her a bill of divorcement sent her out of the house then the latter husband either divorces her or sends her out of his house, or if he dies, then her former husband, which sent her away, may not take her again to be his wife. After that, she is defiled. So Yehovah sent them out of his house. They went, they hoard with the people of the land. They entered into covenant with the people of the land, the people of the nations. Yehovah is not allowed to take them back to be his wife. Ezekiel 37, 19 to 24 tells us something different though. It says, say unto them, thus said, uh, Adnai Yehovah, behold, I will take the stick of Joseph, which is in the hand of Ephraim, 
and the tribes of Israel, his fellows. Okay, so Joseph, Ephraim, they are the, the house of Israel. Those terms are uh, synonymous in scripture. And we'll put, uh, put with him even the stick of Judah and we'll make them one stick. Okay, so we've got the house of Israel and the stick of Judah. House of Israel who've been scattered, taken out of covenant, put them with the stick of Judah and make them one stick and they shall be one in mine hand. And the sticks whereon thou writest shall be in thine hand before their eyes. And say unto them, Thus saith um, Adonai Yehovah, Behold, I will take the children of Israel from among the heathen, whither they be gone, and will gather them on every side and bring them into their own land. And I will make them one nation in the land upon the mountains of Israel, and one king shall be king to them all. And they shall no more be two nations, neither shall they be divided into two kingdoms any more at all. Okay, so this is obviously Yeshua that's talking about the king that will be over them. But how is this possible? How are they going to be made? one nation verse 23 says neither shall they defile themselves anymore with their idols nor with their det detestable things nor with any of their transgressions but i will save them out of all their dwelling places wherein they have sinned and will cleanse them so that they shall be my people and i will be their god and david my servant yeshua shall be king over them and they all shall have one shepherd they shall also walk in my judgments and observe my statutes and do them Okay, so the house of Israel are going to be brought back into covenant. They will be married to Yehovah again. Hebrews 8, 6 to 8 says, But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry, by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. This is Yeshua. Okay, this is the new covenant that is being spoken of here. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then no place should have been sought for the second. Okay, so what was the fault with the first covenant? It says, for finding fault with them, with the people. He saith, behold, the days come, saith Yehovah, when I will make a new covenant. Who is the new covenant with? Is it just with anybody? No, it's with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Here we've got a prophecy. I'm going to make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. How on earth is he going to do this if he's not allowed to take the house of Israel back to be his wife acts 1 4 to 6 shows us again that they had uh, an idea of how this was going to happen it says and being assembled together with them commanded them they should not depart from jerusalem but wait to the, for the promise of the father which saith he ye have heard of me for john truly baptized with water but ye shall be baptized with the ruach hakadesh not many days hence when they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? Okay. Now, I don't have time in this teaching because this is about Romans. And we'll bring it back to Romans in a second. But what was going to happen on Shavuot or Pentecost, this brought together the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It was all about this giving of the spirit. And it, it baffled me why uh, Yeshua said that he had to go to send the spirit when the spirit was in him. Uh, it was in Zechariah. It was in John the Baptist. Okay, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, Simeon, who we saw before, how was it that it was on these men and Yeshua uh, breathed on the disciples and they all received uh, the spirit before Pentecost? How is that possible? Um, so I prayed and I fasted over this. And what I'll say to people is if they're interested in how this was all uh, brought back together and how uh, Pentecost, Shavuot, the fulfillment of that, how that brought together the house of Israel and the house of Judah, I'd just say, don't have time now, but if you go to YouTube, you do a search for the Way Biblical Fellowship, go to playlists, and you go to the Butchered Doctrine playlist, you go to part six, Pentecost and the giving of the Spirit, I think that you'll find uh, a meaty, substantial teaching there. But well, back to Romans. Okay, so he said, Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law. Obviously, knowing the scriptures is uh, very important, as we've just seen. Uh, that information in the scriptures is key to understanding what Paul is about to say. He says, How that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. For the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. 
But if the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. Okay, so we're putting this into the context of the house of Israel, who have been scattered amongst the nations. They've been given a bill of divorcement, and according to the Torah, they are not allowed to come back uh, and be married again to the husband. But this is saying, but if the husband's dead, she's loosed from the law of her husband. So then, if while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress, as she was. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law, so she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Okay, so how does this all fit into the picture? Verse 4 uh, illustrates for us. Paul says, Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Messiah. This shows us that Messiah is Yehovah, because Yehovah was the husband. We become dead to the law by the body of Messiah by his death just like the death of yehovah that's what it is so we become dead to the law that you should be married to another even to him who was raised from the dead so he didn't just come and die to free us from that law so that we could come back into covenant with him he raised from the dead so that we could be married to him again this is how the mystery was solved of how the house of israel could be divorced and yet brought back into covenant this is one of Paul's seminal uh, pieces of writing. Verse 5 says, For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sins which were by the law did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. Okay, so when we were in the flesh, when we did sin, okay, and sin is defined by the law, it brought forth fruit unto death. And we looked at that last time. If people don't understand uh, how sin brings forth uh, death, then I'd say just go back and watch the last teaching. Verse 6 says, But now we are delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in the newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. So when we were under the law, when our transgressions were held against us under the law, through Messiah's death, we were made free from the law. We were delivered from the law, but were we delivered from the law just then so that we could live as if there was no law? No, now we should serve in the newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. To serve in the newness of spirit, as we'll see, another prophecy from Ezekiel, he says that he will put his spirit within us and cause us to walk uh, by his statutes and by his judgments. So that's what it is to serve in the newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter because if we were to go by the letter of the law then all of us have sinned all of us have fallen short of the glory of god we all have this opportunity now to repent to turn back now that we've been delivered from being under the law by which we would all be dead so that we can serve in the newness of spirit you see people will just go so far with this and they'll say we've been delivered from the law but they won't say what the what the outcome of that is supposed to be to allow us to come in repentance to walk in the newness of spirit to walk in the newness of life having put to death that body of sin as paul says you see in romans 6 12 to 14 it says let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body okay serve in the newness of spirit don't let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin. So Paul couldn't be any more clear in saying, no, don't break the law. But yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead. We were dead. We were delivered from the law under which the penalty of which was death. But we are alive from the dead. Yield your members as instruments of righteousness, instruments of keeping the law unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin? Shall we break the law because we're not under the law? Shall we break the law because the law, um, we've been forgiven of our transgressions under the law, but under grace? God forbid. No, of course we don't break the law now that we have been forgiven of our transgressions. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants you are to whom ye obey. Whether of sin, you're the servant of sin. And what does that lead to? Death. 
or of obedience unto righteousness. You're the servant of obedience unto righteousness. Obedience unto righteousness, what's that? Again, we need to look at the definition of these terms. Obedience unto righteousness is obedience to the law. So if we're servants of sin and we obey sin, that leads to death. If we obey obedience unto righteousness, then that is the end thereof, eternal life. So Paul can be understood very simply if we just understand the terms that he's using, but people only read certain parts of Paul, the bits that they understand, and the terms that they don't understand, they kind of just brush aside. Okay, so Paul says very, very clearly, shall we break the law because we are not going to be judged by the letter exactly of the law? God forbid. Okay, now we yield ourselves servants of obedience unto the Torah, unto righteousness. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin. Okay, that's our past. We were all sinners. We'd all fallen short of the glory of God. You were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered to you. In John 8, 31 to 34, Yeshua speaks in very similar terms. Verse 31 says, Then said Yeshua to the Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then ye are my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. The Torah is called the truth. Okay, thy word is truth. What word was he talking about? He was talking about the Tanakh. He was talking about the Torah, the prophets, and the writings. They answered him, We be Abraham's seed and were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be made free? Yeshua answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, whosoever committed sin is the servant of sin. This is exactly what Paul is talking about uh, here in verse 16. Okay, don't you know that to whom you yield yourself servants to obey, his servants you are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death, which is what Yeshua is talking about. And he's saying you will be made free of this. We're made free to be the servants of obedience unto righteousness, to walk then in the spirit. Verse 7 says, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, thou shalt not covet. So Paul is revealing something to us here. He's saying, I'm not saying the law itself is sin, okay? But it defines sin for us. And so sin is then imputed to us because we know what is right and we do it and we do wrong anyway. And that becomes sin. But that doesn't mean the law is sin. It's just telling us what sin is. Exactly what John says in 1 John 3, 4. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. So many people are just missing this very uh, basic definition that if they understood that breaking the law was sin, all of their outlook on whether or not we should keep the law would inevitably have to change. Verse 8 says, But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me, all manner of concupiscence, for without the law, sin was dead. Okay, so without the law, sin has no power. But because the law defines for us what sin is, that gives it power. Because we then know we are culpable before God for doing what is wrong in his sight. Verse 9 says, For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. So without the law, sin was dead. It had no power, okay, because God does not impute sin where there is no Torah, as we'll see. We saw it as we were going through Romans 5. But when the commandment came, sin revived, and now sin has power, and I died. Sin brings forth death, as he says. In Romans 5, 12 to 14, it says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Okay, so by one man sin entered into the world. Death entered in, because sin entered in. Then death passed upon everyone, because everyone had sinned. For until the law, sin was not in the world, but sin is not imputed where there is no law. Okay, so sin was happening in the world. People were doing what was wrong in Yahuwah's eyes, but he didn't hold it against them until the Torah had been given. Verse 14 says, Nevertheless, death 
reign from Adam to Moses, even over them which had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression. So when Adam sinned, he did it knowingly. Yah had given him a commandment. It said, don't eat of that tree. Adam ate of the tree anyway. So that was how Adam's transgression was. He knew what he was doing. It's just told us that sin is not imputed where there is no law, where the instructions haven't been given. So verse 14 says, but regardless of that, death still reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those people who had not sinned, knowing the definition of right and wrong. So Paul says in verse 10, the commandment which was ordained to life, I found to be death. This is a very interesting concept. The commandment is meant to bring life. Okay, that's not, it's meant to bring life to us to keep it. But to us who are sinners, we find it to be death because then we are under the death penalty for having broken the law. John 12, 46 to 50, again, Yeshua speaks in very similar terms. He says, I am come a light into the world that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. And if any man hears my words and words and believe not, I judge him not. For I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. Okay, so I've come to bring life to the world. To the world, I didn't come to to judge it. I came to save it and to tell them the word of God. But if someone rejects me and receives not the words that I speak, the word of God, the word will judge him. Okay. Verse 49 says, for I have not spoken of myself, but the father which sent me, he gave me a commandment, what I should say and what I should speak. And I know that his commandment is life everlasting. Okay. So this is what the word is supposed to be. This is what the commandments are supposed to be. But as Paul points out to us who are sinners, who have rejected the word, the word becomes death to us because we're in disobedience to it. Verse 11 says, for sin taking occasion by the commandment deceived me and by it slew me. By the commandment, sin slew me. It took its power from the fact that I knew right from wrong then and it slew me. Paul talks about something very, very similar or the same thing in 2 Corinthians 3, 3 to 9. He says, for as much as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Messiah ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshly tables of the heart. Okay, so these are tables of the heart that it's talking about. When it talks about tables of stone and fleshly tables, it's talking about a heart of stone and a heart of flesh. And such trust have we through Messiah to Godward. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of, our, of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. People will say, well, we can't have our own righteousness. Okay, we're not sufficient of ourselves. That's not how it works with following the law of God. If you're following the law of God, you're relying on his righteousness because that's what the law is. His definition of righteousness. Verse six says, who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, the new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter killeth, but the spirit giveth life. Okay, so to understand what he's saying here, the letter of the law kills because all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Our only hope at that point is to repent, to accept his grace, his forgiveness for our transgressions, and then to walk out in the spirit the Torah, to live as we were meant to live in the first place. Verse seven says, but if the ministration of death written and engraven in stones was glorious so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away. Okay, so the ministration of death, what was the ministration of death? It was the law when it was written and engraven on hearts of stone. But Yehovah tells us something very important about this. In Ezekiel 36, 26 to 27, he says, a new heart also will I give you and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh so that the law is no longer a ministration of death written and engraven on stone. And I will give you a heart of flesh so that the law can be written on a heart of flesh by the spirit. 
Verse 27 says, and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and ye shall keep my judgments and do them. This is what it is to not walk, um, to walk by the spirit, not in the flesh, to walk in the newness of the spirit, not in the oldness of the letter. Because if we were to just rely on the letter of the law without the spirit, then we would all be sinners and we would all uh, come under the death sentence. This is exactly what Paul is talking about here when he calls the law a ministration of death. But it's not always a ministration of death. It's only a ministration of death when it's written and engraved on a stony heart that is rebellious to it. He says in verse eight, how shall not the ministration of the spirit be rather glorious? How much more glorious is it when the law is written on our hearts by the spirit. He says, for if the ministration of condemnation be glory, the law was amazing. It was amazing when it led to people's death. It stands alone as God's definition of righteousness. It's amazing. But if it's that amazing when it brings forth condemnation to people, how much more doth the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory? In other words, when you're following it according to the spirit, how much more amazing is that? So in verse 12, he says, wherefore the law is holy and the commandment holy and just and good. Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid. But sin, that it might appear sin, worketh death in me by that which is good. In other words, sin, when we recognize it as sin, works death in us by the law. Okay, the law is good. Sin works death in us, though through the law because we know what is good and we know what is wrong that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful for we know that the law is spiritual but i am carnal sold under sin so paul is not saying that the law is the problem here he's saying that the law is glorious we know that the law is spiritual that it's holy and just and good the problem is us we're carnal and we're sold under sin verse 15 says for that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. So he's saying, look, that which I do, I don't agree with. You know, if it was up to me, I wouldn't do these things. Because what I would, in other words, what I would do, that do I not. Okay? What I want to do, I don't do those things. But what I hate, that I do. If then I do that which I would not, I consent uh, that the law, that it is good. Okay, so if I don't want to do these things, but I find myself doing them anyway, I consent that the law is good because I agree with the law. That's what I want to do. Verse 17 says, now then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. Okay, so what I want to do, I don't do. Okay, but my will is to do those things. But I don't know how I'm going to do these things. For the good that I would, the good that I would do, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. So Paul's saying, look, when I'm walking in the flesh, I want to do good, but I end up not doing good and doing that which I recognize as evil. Verse 20 says, now if I do that, I would not. It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. Okay, as he said, that is in my flesh. This is why walking in the flesh is not something that we can do and walk with Yah. We have to walk by the spirit. And to walk by the spirit is to submit to Yah. So many people know loads of things about Yah. So many people read the scriptures, they know what the right thing to do is, but they have not come to submission to him. So many people think that they're Christians, think this, think the other, but the, the very simple thing that they need to do is submit to him in everything so that it is no longer a choice to sin. I'm gonna walk in the spirit now. I have put to death my body of sin my flesh. I've done it. I've done that as a once and for all thing. Now that I'm submitted, it's not a struggle anymore because I take my cue for everything from Yah. People will struggle walking in the flesh 
and they'll think, okay, so are we to put the flesh to death on a daily basis? Of course we're not to do that. We put the flesh to death, the body of sin, once and for all. And this is the step that people do not do. And so people struggle with sin for their entire lives. They struggle to do what is right. They do exactly what Paul is talking of here, but he gives us the solution. He says, I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. Okay, this is the exact situation that so many people who call themselves Christians find themselves in. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? I thank God through Yeshua Messiah, our Lord. So then with the mind, I serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. Verse and chapter eight, which we'll get to next time, starts with the solution to this problem. He says, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Messiah Yeshua who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. They don't walk in the flesh anymore because that's where sin dwells. They've submitted themselves. They put that to death. They've left that behind. It's not even a choice of maybe I'll sin today. Maybe I'll do what's right. Maybe I won't. Because Paul says when you're in that state, you find yourself doing things that you don't agree with. And then you hate yourself for doing them. Paul suggests something very radical here. He says, no, you put your flesh to death and you walk in the spirit. And regrettably, that is something that so few people have actually done. And they find themselves struggling with sin every day of their lives. But we'll come back to Romans 8 and look more at that issue next time. Wow, thank you so much, JP. Um, wonderful walk through chapter seven. I know uh, that's that's really one of the the go to ones for a lot of people in church um, is Romans seven and uh, and kind of uh, the way Paul <laughs> he does some tongue twisters in there. I'll yeah. give him that, you know. Um, but uh, we the King James translators as well. It's it's a nightmare. <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. Um, I got some questions stacked up here for you. Um, okay. So, uh, were those the apostles? Okay, so the apostles were sent to only those who were aware of their heritage as no. a lost tribe of Israel. Um, no. Because um, if if they okay, so would the identity have been preserved, or would the lost sheep thought themselves as Gentiles? They did think of themselves as Gentiles. We see that in Acts 2 when Peter addresses uh, the house of Israel and tells them how they can come uh, back into covenant. But the thing is, at that time, an awful lot of the house of Israel were dwelling um, on the banks of the Jordan. That's where they were at that time. They hadn't quite scattered amongst uh, all of the world. And these are the people that Yeshua is telling them specifically to go to at that time. Right now, they're scattered amongst all of the world. Judah is scattered amongst all of the world because it says that the house of Israel and Judah will be gathered from the four corners of the world when Yeshua returns. So Judah is scattered. We kind of think of the Jews that are in the land as the house of Judah, but that's not biblically who they are. Uh, the, the spiritual identity of the house of Israel, of the house of Judah, um, isn't anymore a, a physical lineage. Um, we had a, uh, a visitor um, at our fellowship from Israel. Uh, he was a Cohen, um, and he was a he was a Messianic believer. Um, and I asked him the question about how do Jews today view the topic of the lost tribes of Israel, the the ten tribes? And it was really strange, but it was almost like his mindset placed them under the category of Jews as well. Oh yeah, they, they think that there's evidence throughout the scriptures that they they returned with Judah in Babylon and all sorts of stuff. I mean, it doesn't fit scripturally at all, but that is the mindset, as you say, of a lot of Jews today, that the Jews are now all of Israel, that the house of Israel have become amalgamated within them. And they don't yeah. address the fact that they were divorced. 
Yeah, I think it's really interesting because that really fuels um, a lot of dispensational theology um, and this whole idea of of Zionist Israel is the biblical Israel and Christians over here in the United States or around the world, we're just kind of a support mechanism for the land. Yeah. Um, so it's, you know, it's very interesting, the mindset when you ask a, you know, somebody who came out of Orthodox Judaism, where are the 10 lost tribes? Yeah. Well, it all comes from the Schofield Bible. The Schofield Bible uh, introduced uh, the pre-tribulation rapture, which is a Jesuit theology, uh, futurism, the idea of a future antichrist that was bolstered by the uh, Schofield Bible and also the idea of um, Israel and the whole Zionist thing that became introduced into all the churches mainstream through the Schofield Bible. Next question is, are the lost tribes grafted back into Judah since Yeshua was a Jew? No. You see, Yeshua was the king of the Jews, and people will say, well, he's our king, so does that make us Jews? And the example that I would give here in the UK, okay, Queen Elizabeth is the queen of the Welsh. That doesn't mean that I'm Welsh, okay? I'm from England, but she's my queen as well. She's also just queen of the Welsh. So because he was a Jew just means that he was a part of the lineage of Jacob. You know, he was part of the 12 tribes. But, you know, a king could be selected from any of the tribes, but that wouldn't make all of the tribes become of his tribe, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, why was Judah not divorced? Well, that's a good question. I think it was because they had so many good kings. If I was to guess, it doesn't tell us specifically. It just says Israel was divorced. Judah was not. Um, she also went and played the harlot. But if we look at where the good kings were, they were all from Judah. Okay. Um, next question is, the need for the Messiah is twofold for those of the lost house of Israel versus those who are part of Judah since they weren't divorced. So for example, those who are part of the lost tribes of Israel, they needed to be remarried back into covenant and they needed to be atoned for their sin versus Jews who would just need their sin atoned for. Is is, well, is that a... Th it's one thing that I get into in the Pentecost teaching. It's to do with uh, the cleansing of uh, the temple of the Ruach. Uh, it was to do with Yeshua fulfilling the red heifer sacrifice for the cleansing of the temple, and that allowed the spirit uh, to come back in amongst those who had been defiled. So uh, uh, someone of the house of Judah who uh, needed to come back in repentance would need Yeshua as well. But as we get into Romans 11 later on, we'll see it talks about the house of Israel and the house of Judah, and then it, it tells us absolutely flat out that the house of Judah have now been cut off and they can be grafted back in if they abide not in unbelief. So in a way, Judah is just as much divorced um, as Israel and everyone needs the Messiah, of course. Um, yeah. But th it is going to be a remarriage for Judah just as much as it's a remarriage for Israel. Yeah. And we really need to get away from the idea that the Jews in the land are the house of Judah. They might physically be the house of Judah, they might be the descendants of, but the uh, Jacob, Jacob is a spiritual identity. And when Paul says in Romans 9, uh, which we'll get on to, uh, when he says that they are not all Israel who are of Israel, he's talking about Israel and man. He's talking about Jacob, all those who descended of Jacob, not all of them are Israel in God's eyes when God talks about Israel. Uh, not all of the descendants, like with uh, Abraham, Okay, he had two sons. He had uh, Ishmael and he had Isaac. Okay, Isaac was the son of the promise. He had two sons. He had Esau and he had Jacob. Only those of Jacob, or only Jacob, he was uh, the son of the promise. When it comes to Jacob, Israel, he has sons as well. And some of them are children of the flesh, and some of them are children of the promise. And it says, those who are of the flesh, they are not the children of God. That's what it says in Romans 9. So just because somebody is a physical descendant doesn't mean they're a child of God, nor that they are Israel in God's sight. It's a spiritual identity based on who you are if you turned in repentance and you trust in uh, Yah.
How does people recently keeping Torah relate to the regathering of Israel? And how long do you think we have until everyone who will wake up as the, as Israel is, is woken up? You know, how long is this timeline going to stretch out? Okay. I think um, if we look at the prophetic model that we have, there was um, when they came out of Egypt, there was the first generation and there was the second generation and the first generation to come out who'd seen all of these amazing things, they were actually still unfaithful all the way through. They were unfaithful. And so many people in the Torah movement today don't keep the commandments. They don't have that faith, which is what is looked for. It's going to be the second generation. And, you know, we've got Joshua and Caleb as a, a model of the few from the first generation who are going to make it through. I think really we're seeing the first generation now of people coming out of all of the nonsense and we're going to have the second generation who are just going to have that faith. They're going to be told, you know, go after all of these giants, whereas people still have uh, this idea um, of this false gospel that we can presume upon his grace, that we don't now have to turn and walk in total obedience, in complete faith and have submitted. Like I was talking about having submitted, so few people have actually submitted. So few people are in the position of that second generation who just stormed into the land and took it. They're still walking in unbelief. They, they talk Torah, but they don't actually do Torah. They don't have that faith of this is what's said. So I will stick by this 100%, no matter what it costs me. They've still got in their head, oh, well, maybe if I need to work on the Sabbath, I'll work on the Sabbath. Um, you know, I've, I've got grace. It's not the way that it works. We're to have submitted ourselves and to walk in the newness of life, completely walk by the spirit, completely by the word, being new creations, not the old creation with some adaptations. So I think that we've got a little bit left. Is this your other answer? <laughs> um, referring to Hebrews 8.8, 8, um, uh, which talks about the new covenant, um, some people say we must wait for our glorified bodies before we can keep the Torah in the way Yahweh really talks about. So are we in the new covenant now? Or yes. Is, it, okay. It, it tells us in Hebrews, it says the old covenant was established with the blood of bulls and goats. The new covenant has been put in place by the blood of Yeshua. So we are under the new covenant now. I know people have uh, difficulty with the verse that talks about uh, each man will not teach uh, his brother saying, no, Yehovah. And that's it's very simply understood because what was happening there is everyone was telling everybody else, this is how you know Yehovah. Paul talks about the gift of teaching being given by the Ruach. So the teaching that is meant to happen anyway, the teaching that's meant to happen in the new covenant is by the Ruach. It's to be Ruach-led. So it's not, it's not people that are teaching. It's meant to be Yah that is teaching through his people. It's not everybody telling everybody else, okay, this is what I think. This is what I think. Okay, it's supposed to be Ruach-led teachers, just as the model has always been through uh, Torah. What is some advice you have for believers who would want to practice putting their flesh to death daily? Well, Again, it's not about doing it daily. It's about coming to that decision of whatever it costs me, every step of the way, I will do Torah. I have fully submitted myself. I have put to death the old self. That's not something that you can say that you do every day. It's something that happens. And then from that point onwards, whatever it costs you, you know, you look at the faith of the people in scripture, it's whatever it costs them. That's the faith that is, is spoken of as saving faith throughout scripture, whatever it costs them, they've put to death the old self. If they mess up and they're like, I can't believe this. I was doing my absolute best and I've messed, I've messed up here. Then of course, grace covers that situation. If you then turn in repentance, you're like right back on, back on the track, a hundred percent full steam ahead. Now, nothing is going to sway me. But if you walk throughout your life thinking, Ooh, Maybe, maybe I'll sin. Uh, you know, I probably shouldn't. Oh, don't sin, don't sin, don't sin. And then you find yourself sinning. That's not submission. 
that's uh, walking with a foot in both camps, basically. Since we are in the book of Romans, uh, why do most churches start new believers on the book of Romans with the Roman road? And what's your comment towards that? Well, I think that the... I think that it's a useful device in showing that the law shows us what sin is. It's like um, there's there's a ministry out there that will go through the Ten Commandments with people, and they'll, they'll show them basically their sin by the Ten Commandments. But then at the end of it, they'll say, accept Jesus and repent, not explaining what repent means. Um, and, you know, now now you're saved. You don't go on and sin. But they they don't really grasp what's going on with the law, that the law is the definition of sin. So I think that there are things in Romans that are very, very good to show, look, you're sinful, you're fallen before God, and now you need to repent. But they don't go that further step of saying, and this is what repentance is, it's obedience to the Torah. Okay, you, you go along on the Shabbat, you hear Moshe being preached, and then as you hear it being preached, you put it uh, into action. You don't have to have it all in place you just have to have um the the willingness to when you hear it make that change have that faith in god it's like um the the guy that i uh, teach with at the way he gave an example of look if you think about somebody arriving for uh, their first day of work two completely different attitudes of arriving and saying I, I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing, but then as you find out the things that you're supposed to be doing, you know, you're supposed to come in at nine o'clock, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You put them into action immediately. You don't come in and say, oh, you know, <laughs> doing this nine o'clock thing, that's a bit difficult. Maybe I'll get there one day. We're all on a journey. Okay, and two completely different mindsets. One is still faith, and we are um, we are given grace to allow us to come into obedience to Yah. We're not given grace as a way to say, well, oh, maybe I'll do this stuff one day. I'll just learn about it all for now. And, uh, you know, I've put God aside in this matter. But in the things that I want to do, I'll do these things. All right. I have one last question. Um, okay. People who say they have the Holy Spirit um, justify sometimes not keeping various commandments because they have not been convicted yeah. um, and since they are believers that they say god would convict them if doing this or that was actually wrong what do you have to say to people who you know abide by that mentality okay well first point i'd make is it says that the holy spirit causes you to walk in the statutes and judgments there's another spirit that's talking talked about called the spirit that works in the children of disobedience so if you've got two spirits one causing obedience and one causing disobedience i question very much whether they have got the ruach hakadesh the holy spirit even though this spirit is obviously masquerading as the holy spirit uh, the other thing that i'd say is the sword of the spirit is the word of god the spirit and the word are inextricably linked they are the same okay they are Yahuwah, the word is Yahuwah in that form. Okay, it's a description of him, of his ways. The spirit is Yahuwah. So to be to be convicted by the spirit, it's kind of if you read something in his word and you know that his word is him, if you're not convicted at that point to do that simply because it's in the word of God, then you're not convicted by the spirit. You don't really understand what the spirit is because the spirit is the word of God. And I know a, a lot of the argument that comes against this is ministers and pastors that have been in Christianity for decades. Um, well, you know, high standing, upstanding members of their community and everything who don't keep all of the Torah, but they've been believers their entire lives and they kind of have the mentality of, well, I've been a Christian my entire life. If this was really wrong, God would have convicted me along the way somewhere. But yeah. yet they still, you know, retain their high positions in the in the church and, and they teach um, oftentimes against keeping the commandments. So for somebody who's really deeply rooted in their Christian faith, who hasn't 
come to Torah and they feel like, well, if it's wrong, wouldn't God have convicted me along the way somewhere? You know, what, what encouragement do you have for them who, somebody who might be hearing this for the first time? Well, it says in Proverbs 24, verse 12, if they say, behold, we knew it not, does not he who weighs the heart perceive it? Okay, he knows what your heart is, but it also tells us in Proverbs 28, verse 9, he who turns his ear away from hearing the Torah, even his prayer is an abomination. They're two completely different states of being. To not know about it, but to have gone after God just devoutly, okay, that's what his grace is is for okay but if you turn your ear from hearing if you hear who he actually is you hear of all of these commandments and you go no it's not for me i prefer my christian religion these things that men have added okay i prefer the the comfort of some of the things within this and you turn your ear away from hearing the truth then you're in a very different position with god torah is there to show us what sin is so if we then discover things in our life that we've been doing innocently, but that are sin, then all we need to do is the same process as anyone in any other condition of sin is repent, is turn back to doing what is right before you are. He, he's not a dictator where he's like, you, you must have everything perfect. Even the stuff that you didn't know, you must be doing that perfect as well. Okay, it's just when we come to um an understanding of what is right then we begin to do it excellent jp thank you um for all of those answers um is there anything else you'd like to say that's all i have um no no that's great Look forward all right to <laughs> Yeah, well, guys, you heard it. Be looking forward um, to the Romans 8 commentary uh, that'll be coming out soon. And thank you once again, JP, for joining us on Now You See TV to do this commentary. I, I always enjoy um, when you take us through the scriptures. It's very, very in-depth, and I, I really appreciate it. Of course. Thank you for having me on. All right, guys. Um, have a good day. I know uh, John and David are just about to get started on the um, Book of Enoch commentary. So um, for those of you who are on the nystv.org uh, uh, website uh, subscription service, um, look out for that um, because uh, I know they're about to knock one out here uh, this afternoon. So all right, everybody, take care. Have a good afternoon and good night, JP, over there in, uh, in, in Europe. I know you're, <laughs> it's nighttime for you, so have a good evening. Yeah, you too.